So welcome everyone to Hotel Q&A. We are super excited to have Jennifer Moore with us today. Welcome, Jennifer. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, okay, so I guess first things first. So I asked Jennifer to come on because um, I had talked to her previously um, about some experiences that she had had at a prior company around Hotel. Um, and I thought it was a, a really, really interesting and compelling story. So um, I guess we'll start with, uh, why don't you give us some background? I know this is, it's not at your current employer, it's at a previous employer. Why don't you give us some background of, you know, their, uh, for starters, like what their their application stack was like, um, and um, and then go from there. Sure. Um, this was a whole job ago, and all of this was happening like a year ago. So um, some of the details will have gotten fuzzy for me um, by this point, but that's cool. Um, so the company um, is called Screencastify. Um, they make a like screen recording application, um, and um, the uh, like. The product was um, a kind of early days of a version two, which would um, have like be a you know video hosting and editing service, um, whereas before it had been just kind of a screen recorder and it was saved to whatever storage you happen to have handy, um, and that was the whole thing. Um, so the stack um, was uh, lots of TypeScript um, with a. Uh, um, and all running in like GCP um, in containers. So the um, like the main backend was a uh, TypeScript, um, I think next JS, I forget, some TypeScript um, backend server um, <clears throat> running in uh, um, Google Cloud Run. Um, this were like serverless containers um, product that they have. Um, and um, that everything is serverless will or many things are serverless will be relevant. Um, and then there was also, um, and so like that backend handled all of the uh, like, you know, routine, um, you know, we're hosting a web service um, kind of stuff like account management and billing and et cetera. Um, and also some on-demand video um, encoding. Um, and then there was um, what we called the, uh, task system, I think, or job system, um, something like that, um, which was um, like that ran in Kubernetes. Um, and it was, um, you know, a bunch of, um, you know, Kubernetes uh, microservices that would, uh, um, you know, respond to um, videos being uploaded and um, edited and things um, to do, um, you know, video transcoding and processing work on that stuff. Um, and um, that all um, was powered by a BullMQ, uh, um, a BullMQ message queue, um, job queue, um, whatever. And um, yeah, and I don't know, otherwise ran fairly self-contained. All right, all right. And, and what was your role then um, at, at this company? Um, I joined as um, a kind of like DevOps lead. Um, it was like my, uh, like a lot of what I did there was to kind of drive DevOps practices and um, then also like do the um, chop wood, carry water parts of DevOps. Um, so a lot of uh, working on um, the like CI CD pipelines, um, a lot of work on observability um, and uh, internal tooling and um, developer experience and things, you know, everything that um, wasn't primarily focused on like building a feature in the application um, was probably something that came across my keyboard at some point. Cool. So that's a, that's a lot of hats to wear then. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. So now you mentioned observability and we are here. <sighs> Yeah. So tell us, um, tell us to what extent, like, when did you realize or or actually let's take a step back. Um, did the company um, see a need, a big enough need for observability? Like, had they seen that already when you had joined? Um, yes. 
Somewhat, I think. Um, like, I think that they, like, you know, they had encountered the concept um, and they had, you know, made a start at like trying to do some observability things. Um, you know, there were definitely some people who like recognized that it was a good idea um, and like nobody was fighting them about it. Um, but they also didn't, I think they didn't really know what they should expect out of it. Um, and so they'd kind of like, done some like scattered starts at it and um, instrumented some things um, and but like you know some things in isolation and it wasn't in a very useful way um, and so um, you know when I got there there was uh, like they had tracing um, but uh, like you know very disconnected um, and um, not really the things that people were interested in um and so a lot of like anything that anybody actually needed to get out of it um, before i took that on um came from logs okay okay so then um you entered into the picture um and what was at that point when you started like implementing um or uh, making making the systems more observable like what what was sort of your your um motivation for that um and so my motivation like throughout for um, making the system more observable was that I wanted to better understand what it was doing. Um, because, you know, like one of the, like one of the hats I was wearing was like SRE um, and I needed to support these things. Um, and that's basically impossible to do if you don't know like what it is or what it's doing. Um, and certainly not, you know, like how it's behaving. Um, and so, um, like after, you know, like after a little while, um, I grew very uncomfortable not having like that understanding of the system um, and decided to just start like, you know, kind of remove the um, false start instrumentations that, um, we're already there and start instrumenting things more consistently. So you actually went into the application code and started instrumenting things. Um, somewhat. Okay. Um, so mostly what I did was um, like remove the auto instrumenters that were already okay. there um, from like they were I don't know, data dogs, like proprietary ones. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sure they would work if they worked, but they didn't actually auto instrument several of the libraries we were using. And so it wasn't helpful for us. Um, and so I replaced those with um, open telemetry auto in instrumentations, um, which did have auto instrumenters for all of the things we wanted. Um, and suddenly like my flame, flame graphs filled out and I could see what was going on from um, start to finish more or less. And that was exactly what I'd been looking for. Ooh, magic. <laughs> um, and and how was uh like how was your learning curve with with in, in terms of in terms of open telemetry? Is it something that you were fami familiar with initially, or is that something that you had to teach yourself? Um. So yeah, I mean, I was familiar with it like conceptually initially. Um. I I don't know, like back when I was on Twitter. Um. <laughs> I uh, spend a lot of time talking to, you know, observability and resilience folks on Twitter. Um, and um, so, you know, like the, um, like the goals and the concepts and everything was all very, um, like, very familiar to me by that point. But then the actual mechanics of like, how do you like turn on and start using open telemetry um, was not something I had done before. And so like, was that, did that end up, end up being like a single-handed effort on your part like did you have anyone from your team assisting um yeah like i didn't i really did not want to be like the only person who knew what it was doing or how it was working um and so like i did do the initial setup myself but then like i made a point to kind of stop there and um like and like distribute follow-up work um from that to the rest of the devops team um, at least so that, you know, there would be other people who knew what was going on and um, knew what they were looking at whenever things needed attention. And how was that received within your team? Um, I mean, I think that went really well. Um, you know, the, um, like, distributed tracing is 
uh, there's some inherent complexity to that domain. And so there's um, some sort of ed like learning and um, ramp up um, to get comfortable with the concepts there um and you know everybody had to go through that but i think like after having gone through that everybody was very pleased to have done it um and very happy to have it that's really great and so you know in terms of so did you would you say then that you were like starting to see um favorable results um like did or i mean you you mentioned that you know you started you yourself started seeing some favorable results, like seeing the the things on the flame graphs. Um, how would you say the the rest of your team took it, and even a step further, like how about management? How did they how did they take that? Did they did they see that as a benefit? Um, I think uh, you know at first management was kind of I don't know like like neutral um, to like neutral or positive about it. Um, you know, they, like, again, it was a thing that they recognized um, was a good thing to do, but I don't think they really saw how much value it has at first. Um, you know, but then we get to uh, some stories with some incidents in them. Um, and I think the value of it becomes a lot more obvious to them um, at that point. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, just uh, circling back a little bit, like, you know, you, you, it sounds like you did a lot of stuff around the um, auto instrumentation side of things. Um, do you think, like, did this incentivize the developers of the actual application to go and do some additional work and add some, like, manual tracing, for example? Um. Yes. Um, like there were definitely some engineers who were very on board with the idea of having tracing and, you know, wanted to, um, like, wanted to go all in on that. Um, and, you know, then there were others who didn't, you know, like, again, were pretty neutral about it. Um, I yeah. think, you know, no one was, again, like no one was fighting against it. Um, a lot of it was, you know, like, sure, that seems fine. You can do that. Um, and a handful of boosters. But were they okay with like going in and instrumenting themselves as well to kind of enhance um, what the auto instrumentation was giving? Um, yes, I think so. So like, it's a little bit hard to say um, because honestly, um, some things blew up organizationally, um, ah. you know? <laughs> and so I like didn't, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have as much opportunity for that to actually happen as I would have liked, but um, people were very, there were at least several people who were very like eager to have done it. Right. Right. So at least it was, they, they at least got to like reap the rewards um, of what you had at least set up. Right. Yeah. Which is always a good thing. <laughs> now in terms of uh, your setup, like um, did you, did you end up um, like implementing an hotel collector? Um, they did. Yes. Um, that was okay. something that I had wanted to do. Um, but, you know, so like the company was sort of already on Datadog and kind of invested in the Datadog tooling ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. And so moving like away from the like that proprietary stack and towards the, you know, open telemetry um, libraries and collector and things was a process. Um, but, you know, it, it's one that like I had I tried to start and it continued after I left. And um, my understanding is that um, like everything is open telemetry there now. Um, and I think they've even moved away from Datadog to another vendor. Oh, wow. That's, that's really cool to be able to like move to, you know, fully like vendor neutral sort of setup mm -hmm. is, yeah. is super awesome. And I think especially like you had set the wheels in motion around that and that it continued even after you left. Yeah. Now, how's that continued? Like, um, you know, the, the knowledge that you gained at your previous workplace, is it something that you've been able to apply where you're at right now or? Uh, yes and no. Um, so right now, um, like I am at, uh, Influx Data. Um, and so at Influx, um, our, like, well, when there's been, um, sort of all of the engineering attention, um, has been 
directed towards getting you know the 3.0 version of the database into um like uh to 3.0 <laughs> um and uh um you know which is the thing that like we have done now and that's going um pretty well um and so that you know frees up some people to think about other things again um and sort of where that intersects with observability and open telemetry has been more about um like getting the database itself to be um a uh like a, a better better suited to work as a um, back end for um, collecting spans and telemetry data um, rather than like instrumenting our own things um, with uh, mm -hmm. um, for traces. Um, and so we do have a lot of um, we do have a lot of things that are very well instrumented um, and like very uh, like very very detailed instrumentation. Um, and a lot of that is very manual. Um, and that's done um with more of a performance um like um like with the objective of understanding performance um more than like behavior or um sort of investigating um like errors or things like that and so mm. um <clears throat> which is to say there's um like very deep small spans as opposed to like um you know wide spans which um i think are uh a little bit easier to work with if you're trying to like ask, you know, something weird is going on and you have no idea what. Um, yeah. You know. So you end up basically like you have a slightly different goal compared to like yeah. this place, but still using open telemetry to achieve that goal. Yeah. Cool. And um, what would you say like were the most challenging aspects like given all your experience around open telemetry what were, what were the most ex challenging aspects in terms of implementing open telemetry um in your specifically in your previous organization um yeah so i like i think the most challenging um i think the most challenging was that there like had already been a like a start with a vendor proprietary SDK. Um, and so that um, did a lot, like, that confused a lot of things. Um, I had tried to, like, leave that in place um, while I, like, at first, and then instrument with open telemetry. But, um, you know, then, like, these two libraries just started, like, um, reporting on each other. And um, it made the whole, um, it made, um, traces like more confusing than they had been um, without it. Um, and so, you know, removing that proprietary SDK and just having the one um, mechanism um, for, you know, like in any given process for instrumentation was, um, you know, something that I wish I had done right away um, in retrospect. Um, and I think the other thing was that, um, you know, was in areas where like there did not already exist auto instrumentations. Um, so like I mentioned BoMQ earlier, um, which didn't have one um, until I wrote it because I really needed it. Um, and so, um, and like, you know, I, I say that's a challenge, but also um, a benefit because it like nobody else had one either. Um, and with open telemetry, like it was a viable thing that I could go and write my own um, auto instrumentation package and, um, you know, be able to get that for myself um, with libraries that otherwise just didn't have it. And how, how was that experience of like writing the auto instrumentation yourself? Like, was it a huge learning curve or was it that something? Yeah, that was a pretty substantial learning curve. Um, and um, I don't know, it was a good thing that I started early because, um, you know, then we got into some uh, incidents and I really needed it. Um, and I was able to get it, you know, like functional um, in a relatively short time span from there so that I could start using it and actually see what was going on. That's so cool. And, and, you know, you mentioned that you, you, uh, your, your fellow uh, DevOps engineers were, were leveled up in the ways of hotel. Like, is that something that you help them out with? Like, um, what kind of, like, how is it that they gain the skills, like leveled up so that they could also, um, you know, have that knowledge of open telemetry that you had? Um, 
I mean, I think the majority of that was, you know, just like hands on doing it. Um, you know, the like, um, again, like after, you know, um, I had set up like basically one um, auto instrumentation um, and gotten that configured um, and everything. I like then, um, like, I stopped there and I really did make a point to um, have other people take that further. Um, so that yeah like because i wanted them to have that experience yeah, um yeah. and then um like more broadly we did also have um like early on there there was a very strong learning culture which was one of my favorite things about that company um and so we had a like a sort of like technical book club um and we read the uh observability driven development um book for that book club and um You know, I think that that was also very useful in terms of getting some, a lot of people familiar with the, like, at least the concepts and, you know, what you should um, sort of, like, clarifying expectations about what, like, this gets you um, as, you know, like, from an ops perspective and from an yeah. engineering perspective and, yeah. And hopefully you got them stoked, too, about it, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, it was um, a very, like, the people who were inclined to be interested um, definitely came away from that more interested. Nice, nice. It, it's really cool that this is a very, like, sort of operational driven um, uh, hotel undertaking, which I, I guess it kind of makes sense because, like, when, when things break, um, it's always going to be... <laughs> more on the operational side of things. And it's not necessarily the developers that are going to be the ones who are going to, you know, be, oh, why is this breaking, right? Because by then it's like, I hate to say it, but less less their concern, even though it is very much their concern. But unfortunately, I think I think our, our culture is still kind of shifted <laughs> towards the not my problem because it's in production. Yeah, it is. Um, it is a little bit farther away. Um, from them and like I have some sympathy for that I've, I've spent a lot of time you know doing app dev um, and um, like but also only some sympathy because the whole time I was doing app dev I was very frustrated by my inability to have any contact with production um, and so I don't know and like that was also one of the things that I was trying to drive there like beyond, you know, observability and open telemetry was to, like, actually fulfill some of the promise of DevOps and have, yes. um, you know, <laughs> have that not be such a bright line between the two. Do you think, uh, do you think you got closer to, uh, to achieving that goal? I, I think so, yeah. Um, one of the, um, I, and, like, one of the ways I did that was to, like, really emphasize um, sort of how the tools are used um, whenever, um like whenever it came up um so you know like in doing incident um retros the like um you know i made a point to ask people like what did you look at um that made you think that that was um you know the the concern um and you know like how did you execute those queries like let's actually open up the tool and um go through the ui and see how that's performed cool Um, I want to go back to, um, you know, our, our chat earlier about like um, management's perspective on on using, you know, observability. And I, I believe you mentioned that it was kind of neutral until they're like, oh, this is this is useful. Um, one of the things that I always find can be challenging in an organization is like, bringing something new to management and, and like, you know, it you almost like need to need that permission from them <laughs> um, before, before executing. So is that something where you like, did you ask for permission or did you end up asking for forgiveness in, in that uh, at that stage? Um, so yeah, like neither, honestly, okay. um, it, the way this worked out. Um, so again, like, you know, they had already, like, before I joined, had whatever conversations they had about, like, getting better observability. And, like, somebody 
I don't know, somebody signed off on doing something um, and, you know, they started some instrumentation. Um, and so that like, that was clearly a thing that was like, you know, that was okay. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. like, um, I didn't need to pitch them on having it. Um, and like, you know, as a matter of fixing it, like that was more of a, um, like, like, I don't know, like a question for my fellow engineers. Um, like, you know, somebody put this in and somebody probably understands it. Um, yeah. and I need to, but like, it's not, you know, satisfying the goals that we had for it, I think. And so I need to do something about that. And like, um, but like management wasn't like, wasn't going to say no to that. Um, right. Because you already had some sort of an observability culture. Uh, yeah. Like. Um, and then in terms of like investing further in it, um, you know, like we ran into an incident. Um, we, you know, launched and um, a big part of this launch was, or a big part of the reason for like going to the sort of 2.0 version of the product um, was to enable some like account and billing um, features that just weren't possible um, with the way that like the, um, like those data schemas existed. Um, and so like part of that and like they existed in Firebase um, and they were moving to a like Postgres to have, you know, real schemas. Um, and that had, I think, some of the predictable problems. Um, and um, the migration kind of stalled out. Um, and that was real bad. Um, and things just stopped working for hours at a time because um, the, like, the migration was kind of killing the, um, the Postgres um server without ever completing um but we didn't know that it just sort of like stopped working um and um like after some initial investigation um like instrumenting all the things to figure out what is even going on um was like the next thing and it wasn't something that i needed permission to do at that point because like you know, production is down and it's going down for hours at a time um, repeatedly. So um, it needs to be fixed. Um, and um, yeah, like, I don't know, yeah, when the building's enough. on fire, you don't need permission to install sprinklers anymore. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So I guess at that point then, even though like you were using like a different uh, different tool set for observability and and you made the decision to like, let's, let's use open tele telemetry instead. At that point, as you said, because <laughs> things were not working, then it became like less, you know, like put in, put in the tool that works for us kind of thing. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, um, and we had already started that by the time we got to, like, that incident. Um, and so, like, that was very fortunate because yes. uh, we were getting, like, we already had a better experience with open telemetry. Like, there were some parts of the system that we, like, could fairly well understand um, what they were yeah. doing. Um, but then, like, the rest of it, you know, that, um, like, had not been instrumented. And, um, and so that, like, that had to be done quickly. Right. So there, that that's your incentive when things are yeah. burning, <laughs> when the house is burning, open telemetry to the rescue. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think uh, before I turn it over to the rest of the folks on this call, um, do you have any um, feedback um, for the open telemetry project as a whole, like good or bad in terms of like your experience? Because um, I mean, you know, like we, one of the, one of the uh, things that we do as as a group here is to um, collect feedback from from users to help make the open telemetry experience better. So, um, um yeah, I like. I'm not sure that. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think that like the, and this was like a year and a half ago that I was doing it or whatever. The like early like getting set up onboarding learning curve is pretty steep um i don't know exactly how to like how to improve that and i'm sure i'm not the first person to have <laughs> said this either um i think you know like if that can be improved that would be great um also i think that like um metrics and logging you know got to like stable um, since I was doing this, um, and it would have been really nice to have had that at the time, I think, um, because it would be, 
you know, very convenient to have, um, like a consistent, uh, sort of like interface and, um, SDK for all of those telemetry signals. Um, and then being able to, um, you know, like send them to a collector and then have the collector send them to wherever they're going. Um, and, um, not making that, like not making those things application concerns, um, is like, would be great. Um, I haven't had an, I haven't had the chance to actually do that um, to see if it works or not. Cool. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else on this call have any questions for uh, for Jennifer? Um, I was just curious on the last piece you just said about having a consistent interface in the SDK for the telemetry signals mm -hmm. and not making them application concerns. What does, um, I was just curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on that piece. Uh, um, yeah, so like, um, so like you have open telemetry for your um, like traces um, and then, you know, like you're going to have some sort of logging solution for your logs and like hopefully you're doing structured logs um, and like again, some solution for metrics, um, assuming you're doing metrics, um, probably Prometheus or whatever. Um, but like, you know, to get like, to get those logs and those um, metrics to go somewhere, um, you wind up having to like configure some um, like vendors uh, like logging library um, so that you can ship your logs to like your logging backend or um, like or you log everything to the terminal or to a file or whatever and have some sort of like infrastructure magic pick it up and send it somewhere. Um, but like and then, you know, Prometheus, like you have to create your um, scraping endpoint and let Prometheus scrape it. And so you have to like have Prometheus configured and able to reach you and et cetera. Um, and um, whereas like, you know, with spans, um, you like configure your exporter and you're done. Um, and your exporter just sends them to the collector. Um, and um, like, and that can like, the collector address or whatever can come from config. Like after you're instrumented, um, you don't have to, like, there's not much to maintain there. Um, and, um, you know, like I would, at the time I would really have, like, have liked to be able to, you know, send my logs and my um, like metrics to the collector in the same way that I was doing the spans, um, rather than like having, you know, three solutions for three different kinds of telemetry. Gotcha. I would say we're getting closer to that, right? Oh, I, think I personally don't know. Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking uh, anyone else. <laughs> I think we're getting closer to it. I think uh, like definitely, I like, I think I think logs are fine. Like metrics are have definitely matured a lot in the last year. Um, and I know a lot of observability backends are now ingesting metrics as well. So in, in addition to traces, which is nice. Um, and then I think we're starting to see that with logs as well. Logs, I know, are a different beast because there's like no um, no logging SDK. There's a logs bridge um, SDK. So the idea is like use use one of the common logging libraries that is supported by open telemetry and there's like a bridge um, SDK for it and then it'll convert that format to OTLP so then it can be ingested by whatever um, whatever backend so which is kind of nice. I guess they didn't want to reinvent uh, reinvent the wheel with logs because there's like so many yeah <laughs> so many different things out there so <laughs> yeah that's that's my understanding of it. <laughs> From my limited time playing with law so yeah yeah like the which i like full sympathy to that strategy the um the momentum on the way people do logs is enormous it's not like that's not changing yeah um but how they get like collected and um organized you know that yeah 
I think the game changer is being able to correlate the logs to the traces uh-huh. so that you have that fuller picture, which I'm super excited about because I understand a lot of us grew up on logs, but I think the traces will help tell the full story. And so when you have that correlation, then then you can get magic. Yeah, I mean, I think logs correlated with traces is like is the best, most ideal outcome. Um, like I know that traces have events and like can do point in time things, but logs are just better at that. Like, um, and you know, being able to see like point in time events um correlated to like where they happen within a span um and within a trace is exactly like that's what i want that's yeah yeah the dream yeah um anyone else have any other comments questions for jennifer shall we break early then cool awesome well thank you jennifer for sharing your story with us uh, i think it i i really love love the story because i think it's the <laughs> Things are broken. <laughs> Need observability. <laughs> so uh, yeah. um, I think it's such a compelling case for anybody who's like on the fence <laughs> on whether or not it's a worthwhile investment. Um, and it's it's awesome that your your company was already kind of had its foot in the door um, for that, and and that you were able to kind of take it further to where it actually needed to be, so that it was useful to. Uh, to you and your team for troubleshooting. So um, I, I think it's I think it's a great story. I hope others will draw inspiration from that as well um, as a compelling reason as to why observability with open telemetry is a good combination. Um, do we have, uh, I think we've got some upcoming events. Yeah, on December the 7th, we have another Q&A. Um, with uh, someone from HashiCorp who has attempted many times to instrument Nomad. <laughs> so that'll be, uh, um, I think that'll be a really interesting story as well. So anyone who is following along, stay tuned for that Q&A. Hopefully we'll get to see you live, but if not, we will see you on YouTube. Sounds good. It was great to meet you all. Yeah, oh, thank thanks you. so much, Jennifer. And uh, we'll let you know once the video is posted. Cool. Yeah, um, yeah, I was going to say thank you, Jennifer, for your story. That's like really, really inspiring because I feel like so many people want to always adopt it, but then getting that buy-in from your leadership team is always a problem because, I mean, technically they're like, it's not making them money until you show that this is like, causing problems and then we ran in into the this. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know why like it's weird that it's such a fight so much of the time. Um because problems are going to happen. And yeah. like what this gets you is being able to point at where the problem is happening. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know why people don't want to be able to do that. Right. So logical. (laughs) In my experience, it only works either in teams that are excited about progressive engineering practices or that are feeling so much pain from vendor lock-in that they're ready to set everything on fire. Yes. Yes. So true. So basically means you need like a really nasty incident or or like really bad vendor lock in as your compelling reason <laughs> well if you get that incident don't let it go to waste yeah totally <laughs> right quote of the day <laughs> awesome well thank you everyone